this talk will be helpful to you and give you maybe a little bit better understanding of some of the styles of weaving and a little um, understanding of the development of Navajo weaving. Um, I'm going to tell you um, two histories of Navajo weaving. It's always important to stress that there, there are two histories. There's the traditional Navajo history, and then there's the, um, the Western history. The first one, according to Navajo oral tradition, Spider Woman and Spider Man, two of the holy people who walked the earth at the dawn of humankind, introduced weaving to the Navajo. The Navajo creation story tells us that Spider-Man constructed the first loom in the third underworld. This loom was made of sunshine, lightning, and rain. The Navajo creation story also tells us that Spider-Woman taught the Navajo how to weave. She was discovered by the holy twins in a small opening in the earth surrounded by an array of beautiful weavings. Entering her dwelling, the holy twins descended a ladder made of yarn, whereupon Spider-Woman offered them knowledge of the world of weaving. Non-Navajo scholars offer a different version of the origins of Navajo weaving. They tell us that upon their arrival in the Southwest sometime between 1000 AD and 1525 AD, the Navajo learned to weave from their Pueblo neighbors. According to this version, Navajo women most likely learned from weavers in Zuni Pueblo or from one of the Western Rio Grande Pueblos such as Jemez. Originally, weaving in the Southwest was done with farmed cotton but with the introduction of sheep by the Spanish in 1698, wool became the mainstay among Navajo weavers. Mm -hmm. The earliest weavings that we have um, are very, very simple. Horizontal stripes, the colors are derived from the natural sheep colors. So the white, brown, and black in this weaving, which is a first phase chief's blanket used style, very, very rare. Um, very few of these still survive. The, the black, white, and grays are all derived from the natural sheep colors, and the blue is from indigo, which was derived from trade with Mexico. Um, the chief's blankets were produced for trade. They were for to, produced for Navajo use as well, but they were widely traded, especially with the Plains tribes, and, and they were considered a very high status item among the Plains people. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a first phase Ute chief style wearing blanket made by Mary Henderson Begay, who's a contemporary weaver. Weavers are still making these. Mary says she loves to make chief's blankets because they remind her of the history of her people. And they specifically remind her of the long walk of Vasco Redondo, the long walk to Vasco Redondo. Okay, so in chief's blankets you see an evolution, you see a stylistic evolution where you have a more complex patterning as you go along historically. And so you can tell the period in which the piece was produced. Um, you can tell the date of it by the stylistic characteristics. And you can also tell from the materials that were used. So you saw the first phase, second phase, this is the third phase. So you can see it becomes more and more complex. And like I said, these are wearing blankets. So this would have gone you know, horizontally around the body and then come together in front. So the half, the half diamonds would have formed a full diamond in the front. So you saw the very early simple patterning of Navajo weaving. That is a very classic phase of Navajo weaving that purists um, admire. And a number of movements in the 20th century were initiated to return to some of those pure elements of Navajo weaving. A return to the hand-spun yarns, which were used in the chief blankets, hand-spun by the Navajo weavers themselves, the, um, the use of the natural wool colors, and maybe the use of very simple vegetal or natural dyes, and simple stripes rather than complex patterning. Because what happened when um, Navajo weaving developed as um, a prized object of trade with people on the east coast of the United States when the railroads came in, um, the patterns became and the de designs became extremely complex and they were based on oriental carpets. And a lot of people who, especially people who are purists about Navajo weaving, see this as the introduction of foreign elements that really have little to do with Navajo culture. So you had a number of people like J.B. Moore or at least several people who were publishing catalogs of Navajo weavings. And he would publish the catalogs, distribute them on the East Coast, 
and people would order them for their homes. And then individuals who came west on the trains also bought weavings here. So weaving started to develop for this market, for a tourist market and also a home furnishing market in the eastern U.S. You know, besides the introduction of foreign design influences, there was an introduction of foreign material. Um, yarns were produced in Germantown, Pennsylvania, which had become known as Germantown Yarns. They were produced in very bright colors, and then they were shipped out to the trading posts on the Navajo Reservation, and they were immediately popular with the weavers because they were extremely vibrant colors, uh, very color fast, really, really good wools, quality wools, and the traders would provide some of their best weavers with these wools. And the introduction of Germantown yarns were seen by a number of people as a degradation because they were not the natural colors that were used by the weavers. Weavers traditionally, Navajo weavers, had used vegetal dye sources. They used the herbs and plants and the clays and various things on the reservation to color their yarns when they did use bright color. Okay, Hubble Trading Post. Um, Hubble wanted to see weavers return to very classic Navajo designs. So reintroductions of crosses, this equal-armed cross that you see a lot. Um, you see some of the classic um, chief's blanket designs on the wall. Um, you see a little vestige maybe of some of the design elements from Oriental carpets, but he mostly was trying to, to suppress that and motivate a return to the more indigenous elements. And then at the Chigray Hills trading post, there was another effort that was initiated to encourage weavers to return to the natural wools and to abandon the aniline colors. Two gray hills weavings are done in all natural sheep's wool colors. The grays and the tans are achieved by carding together different colored wools to get various shades. And a really superior weaver doing two gray hills weavings can get hundreds of shades. All right, so you had all these influences that were seen as corrupting Navajo weaving, and you had various efforts by various traders to try to return to the more classic elements and the classic styles. Um, and then you had uh, several movements to return to vegetal dyes. And these are movements that are still, uh, this attempt to encourage weavers to use vegetal dyes is still very, very current. And this is something that started way back in the 20s. The Chinle Revival, the Wide Ruins Revival, and Modern Crystal. There have been a number of other efforts. These are just the ones that I've been able to focus on. And I'm focus focusing on things that were during the 30s because that's my area of study. So yeah, you know, all along, you're going to be